time slowly to start with our first talk this morning. And Erich Novak will tell us about the LP discrepancy for finite P, strictly larger than one, suffers from the curse of dimensionality. Please. OK. Uh, thank you very much, Winfried. And, and I would like to thank all the organizers for inviting me and for, for, for having such a nice conference. So I already learned uh, many things. So it's really great uh, to be here. I would like to explain what is written on the table, uh, the LP discrepancy for finite P, because in one suffers from the curse of dimensionality. And um, of course, I should explain what I mean by discrepancy, and I should explain what I mean by the curse of dimensionality. So, what about uh, discrepancy? So you really should understand this because it will be used all the time. We have a number of points in a box. The box is d-dimensional, and we have n uh, points in this box, like, like n equal 4. And we compare. <coughs> the volume of, of such a box with a relative number of, with the proportion of, of the points that are inside the box. So in a way, you could even say this is a kind of a quadrature formula for such indicator functions. And of course, we can do it for every box. So this box is here denoted by T. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, the box is denoted by T, and uh, we, we subtract the volume and we take the P. Uh, the P discrepancy is the LP norm of this function. So this function depends on T, and we consider the LP norm of this local discrepancy. OK, and of only course. Bo only boxes which start only boxes which start yes, but it's really not essential. I mean, it, it would change a few constants, but it would not change uh, a lot of stuff. This is more for simplicity. So of course, we want to uh, somehow distribute uh, the points as good as possible, and so we want to minimize uh, this uh, LP discrepancy, and this is called uh, the nth minimal LP discrepancy in dimension E. So it depends on P, the P norm, on N, the number of points, and of course of D, the dimension. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry. So it is very remarkable that uh, the exact order of convergence is known for this uh, P discrepancy, and actually it is well known for many years. Also, the proof of this result took uh, some time, and several colleagues were involved. So, I mean, first of all, the order of convergence is more or less 1 divided by n for in every dimension. So it is, I mean, the main part is always 1 divided by n. And there are some log terms. And the exponent of the log term does not depend on p. So it is always d minus 1 half. That could be the opposite. Yes, there are constructions, yes. I mean, some, some results were first uh, 
I mean, there are, of course, lower bounds. You do not need a construction. And there are upper bounds. And there are constructions, and so on. So, but somehow, for me, the main point is that uh, this is a strictly uh, a result about the order of convergence. And it does not tell you anything about uh, what you achieve, for example, if you take uh, e to the 42 points, which is a relatively large number. And later, we will learn that you do not get anything with such a, a small number of points if the dimension is really large. So this is basically what I mean by the curse of dimension. Really large, what does it mean? Hundreds? Thousands, probably. Because for several hundred, it's a flight problem. I mean, it really depends on P. So, so if P is uh, two, for example, then like like hundred is is big, but if P is very close to one or very close to infinity, uh, I mean it's another thing. So you can go further. Okay, we ask uh, for the minimal number of nodes nodes that are necessary to achieve. Uh, <coughs> such a bound. So we want to improve the initial bound that we get with, with no point at all by an epsilon. And, and this depends on epsilon and e. And we want to study this function of epsilon and d. And two cases are known already. So two cases are known. Uh, the case P infinity is known. There is no curse of dimension. You need only a number of points that uh, is proportional to the dimension D. So this is really very different, this case. And there is also recent work around this uh, result. For example, by Michael Knebuch and his colleagues, he considered uh, the optimal constant C. And, and also, uh, there is work with construction. But I really do not want to enter into this discussion because I'm interested in lower bounds. So the lower bound is only known for, for P equal to. Here you see. Uh, the curse of dimension. So you here you see 9 divided by a to the power d is somehow the exponent. So it is a quite um, fast increasing function. And the techniques for the lower bounds usually are Hilbert space techniques. And in particular, we, we we constructed a, a theory with decomposable reproducing kernels. And, and I mean, we wanted to simplify our method and also modify it for other norms. So we want to, to, to go away from orthogonality and so on. OK. We had last year with uh, Fritz Pilixhammer, we had a result about uh, a particular sequence of P. And, and, but now we, we know it for all P. We know it for all P, the curse of uh, dimensionality. Mm. Only the case P is equal to 1 is still open. And it is clear this case P equal 1 cannot be handled with our technique. So you would need completely new ideas. OK. So uh, this was somehow introduction. And I said it is a result. And now I 
go to numerical indication because I really like to work uh, with lower bounds for numerical indication and it is well known that this discrepancy problem is really equivalent to um, a, a, a problem for, for error bounds for uh, Coubertou formulas. And for this, we need the space of functions, so we need a, a tensor product space, and we take uh, this derivative, so it is one derivative in, in every direction, so altogether it's a, it's a least derivative, and so it's such a, a space of bounded mixed um, smoothness, and in addition, we need a boundary condition, namely we need the function should be zero everywhere when, when just one coordinate is zero. And then we take this norm, which is highlighted here. So this is very fancy. Uh, this is the norm in this function space that we take. And it is well known that um, the discrepancy problem is equivalent to the problem of numerical indication for this class. So we take uh, algorithms, and it is enough to take linear algorithms. And if we have equal weight formulas, with weights a k, one divided by n, then we are exactly in the class of QMC methods, quasi Monte Carlo methods, and then we have equality uh, with a uh, discrepancy, and otherwise it's a little more general if we allow if we allow uh, general weights or positive weights or whatever. Okay, we, we define, as always, we di define the worst case error uh, over the class that we discuss with, with norm one. So this is the worst case error and, and uh, equal weight formulas are like this. And we also consider positive quadrature formulas with positive weights. So the nth worst case error is, of course, the infimum over all quadrature formulas, and for every quadrature formula we take uh, the worst case error over the class. And now we minimize over all quadrature formulas. And it is known what, what the initial error is. So if we take no point at all, so it is then just uh, the norm of the integral operator, and then we get this initial error, and it is also relatively easy to, to, to compute the worst case function. I mean, the, the function with norm one that has the biggest integral in the class. And this is given like this. This is H1. It's such a class, I mean, uh, of course, this function value zero has to be so because we, we, we have to be in the class. And, and in the d-dimensional case, we simply have tensor products. So this is important, this worst case of function later on. OK, and of course, again, we, we, we define such a, uh, such a number here. So, so this is now the complexity, the number of points, the number of function evaluations that are needed to, to improve the initial error by a factor epsilon. And I put a plus if only positive quadrature formulas are allowed. And then the p discrepancy is the same, really the same with equality, if you only allow uh, equal weights, one divided by n, 
and of course is bigger if you allow a bigger class, namely all positive formulas, and it's even bigger if you allow all what are true formulas. Okay, so this is known. And now uh, our result is first the result from last year. Uh, in, in, in this case, Q was an integer, an even integer, and we proved the curse. And um, now we improved this result. But OK, let's take this result. And what did we do? So the general idea of such a proof is always uh, uh, basically the same. Namely, you take any point, xi, x1, x2, x3, n, n, n pieces, and you are looking, given the xi, you are looking for a function in the class, of course, uh, with zero function values and a large integral. So the integral should be as large as possible. And of course, your quadrature formula cannot distinguish between g and minus g. And so you can get with a triangle inequality, you, you can get a lower bound for the error of, of, of the quadrature formula. So this is really the formula. And actually, I mean, I'm not so sure why I did not do it. One could write equality, so, so there's really an equality. But I mean, as we use it, we use really this inequality. So we have to construct fooling functions. Uh, and actually, we construct fooling functions in a relatively small, finite dimensional space. The dimension is 3 to the power d. But it's OK, because uh, this n number n is much smaller than 3 to the power d. So we do not want to prove a result about the order of convergence. This was done by. Volodya and other people. So, so it is really about relatively small n. We want to prove the curse of dimensionality. OK. So as I said before, the case q equal p equal 2 was proved before with Hilbert space methods. And, and actually, we we decomposed uh, this worst case function h1 <coughs> into three parts. Into three parts. And, and the three functions are orthogonal. orthogonal. So uh, one function is like, like, like this. One function, this one, and the second is like this, and the third is like this. And if you add them up, you get uh, H1. So it's like here. And this function H11. What is this hand? Can I put it away? Yes. This function H11, later I will call it a, a, a spline, a spline with small norm. And somehow, uh, but I mean, this will be important a little later. So the function value is the same like for H1, but the norm, of course, is smaller. And the three functions are orthogonal, of course, with respect to this Sobolev norm. 
Okay, now how do we uh, construct the fooling function? Uh, this H1 is the sum of three functions, as I showed you, and HD is the sum of three to the power D functions, and they have all of them have different uh, domains, supports, and uh, we define GD as the subsum of all functions that have a value zero at all of the xi. So we skip all the summons that are different from zero at xi. So it's a, it's a subsum of this a sum with 3 to the power d uh, <coughs> summons. Okay, and, and now because we are in a Hilbert space setting and have orthogonality, it is uh, clear that this subsum has a smaller norm than HD. And this is somehow the tricky part that we do not have for other P and, and this is why we, ha we, we, we had to work. So, and we could do it for only for even Q, we could do it like this. And, and then this computation is, is somehow uh, more difficult. The functions are orthogonal in the Sobolev space. They are, of course, not orthogonal in L2, but we are in the Sobolev space. And, and also, So here, I mean, here, uh, this norm is also in the Sobolev space. Probably it, is, it was hidden somehow, somewhere, but I did not really stress it for that. Mario, look. What do you see, Mario? Yeah, the vertices all so the last <laughs> Okay. Okay, so, so for P equal to, we, we really just get the old result back and no improvement, but also nothing worse. I mean, uh, the improvement is only in the presentation. So somehow we noticed that our nice, what we believed was a nice theory of decomposable kernels was not used by our colleagues. So they always went around it. And, and probably it is a sign uh, that, that it was not attractively enough. And, and at least, uh, it can be, uh, the presentation can be a lot of simplified, but, but of course we, we also are interested in, in different uh, P and Q. Okay, so now what, what are we doing for general P and Q? So in this case, we can only consider positive quadrature formula. So our techniques are not strong enough to, to, to have the full result for the indication problem, but it is enough for the uh, discrepancy problem, of course. So we have a result. The result is like, like this. And I mean, if you have the result, then the proof is very easy. So. Um, you have a, a univariate space of functions and you take the default tensor product space equipped with a cross norm and we have also a worst case function for the functional that we want to uh, compute, I mean for the integral or for weighted integral or so and we assume that also this
uh, represente this HD uh, is a tensor product. And another condition is this. Namely, we have such a spline with small norm, like, like here. If, if this is the point Y, then this would be the spline SY. And the assumption is that they have the same uh, function value here. And, and the norms of of the splines are really smaller than the norm of the worst case function and also the integral is smaller. And it could be just a, a bit smaller, but this is really for the one dimensional case and through the tensor products uh, we get then uh, the curse of dimension. So then the indication problem in FD suffers from the curse of dimensionality for positive quadrature formulas. So this is somehow the restriction, and we really don't know how to get rid of this restriction, and probably it is really needed for some strange examples. But anyway, it is, as I said before, it is enough for, for this discrepancy uh, problem, and the proof of this result is really just two lines, or two, two and a half lines, or what. So you, you take a positive quadrature formula, and this means this weights, AK, are positive, and now we take, as a fooling function, we take F star, and we compare f star with, with uh, h, with the function h. And so we take the sum of those um, splines, and then, because it's a sum of, of n splines, the integral is bounded like this, so the integral is relatively small, but the quadrature formula is very big, it is bigger than the integral, uh, the quadrature formula applied to HD, since all the function values are bigger. And we have positive weights here. So, <coughs> this is finished. L let me say um, two words at the end. So, an advantage of this technique is it works in many cases. It works in many cases, also in cases where this technique of decomposable kernels did not work, because uh, we, we do not need a decomposition. And so it works also for, for analytic functions, for, for polynomials, for example. So we, we have a, an example in our paper with polynomials of degree two and so this is the advantage. Of course, it, it, it cannot work for, for p equal one, because for p equal one, we, we do not have a, a spline with small norm. So, so for, for, for p equal one, it would look like this. The worst case function is a h1. It's just the straight line. And if you now take a y, then you, you do not find a, a spline with the same function value in the smaller norm. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. We have plenty of time for questions, remarks, comments. <coughs> when you're talking about spline with a small norm, small norm in, in which norm? I mean in this space, in this Sobolev space. Again, so, so this is uh, 
the, the silly, I mean, some people, some people or I sometimes define in, in the lectures as blind by some minimum norm property. And, and if you in, are in the space, in the sober space, then this SY is really the, the function with the smallest norm that interpolates H1 at this point. But in any case, if you have this straight line, why are you going to use the same function where, where the second half also goes as, as a constant? I mean, here you could do the same, of course. You, you could, uh, you could, whatever, you could define yeah. uh, SY, but then they have both the same norm. So, I mean, now, now it <coughs> is about the infinity norm. So, so the infinity norm of the first derivative. All right. All right. In, in the case p equal one, yeah. so q is infinity, and 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 you you would not find a spline with a smaller norm. And by the way, I mean you could also uh, uh, consider the case q uh, is equal to one. And of course, the proof also does not work in this case. But but in, in my I mean, this case is not interesting because we already know uh, the problem does not suffer from the curse of dimension. Other comments and questions. So this seems to be not the case, and we have a break of. 10 minutes, even more, 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.